Investors Chronicle. Welcome back to the Companies and Markets show. On the docket this week, Bellway, Burford Capital and Tesco as a safe haven, perhaps? Let's get going. Companies and Markets show, welcome back. Thursday, 31st of March, as we record. Uh, delighted to welcome back to the podcast, Gemma Slingo. Hello, Gemma. Hi. Good to have you back. Uh, Alex Newman. Hi, John. Hiya. And Mark Robinson. Hello, Mark. Uh, all right, there, John. Snowed in. in Snowed in. Well, it's not too bad today, but it was snowing when I got back last night. It's crazy. I literally was like, last week, I was like, are you guys all enjoying the weather? And now this week? Yes, 18 degrees back to freezing. I think, I think it's only appropriate this quarter ended on such a sort of cold, miserable note. Mm. Yes. Is is April the cruelest month, though? I can't remember. I don't um, know. Sorry, I was bringing T.S. Eliot again, not for the first time. <laughs> a poetic start yes. <laughs> to, to, the, to the podcast. Um, lots to discuss today, but before we do, we're going to go into my news roundup. Uh, lots of companies' news this week. Fashion brand Ted Baker have rejected takeover bids from private equity firm Sycamore Partners. Sycamore's latest offer valued the company at around £250 million. That's 138p a share. Uh, that was on Monday, so we await further developments. A few banking lines. The, the government have sold to below a 50% stake in NatWest after a £1.2 billion share sale. Uh, meanwhile, across the, the metaphorical street, Barclays Bank revealed an unexpected £450 million hit to pre-tax profit due to uh, and I quote, a complicated issuance scheme involving two traded securities going spectacularly wrong. Uh, Monday's Today's Markets article on the IC website for more detail on that. Just just search Today's Market and uh, and that'll, that'll come up there. Uh, elsewhere, grocery price inflation is at a 10-year high. The 5.2% in March is the highest level since April 2012, according to Kantar. Sainsbury's and Morrison's have seen market share decline as the price squeeze sends shoppers to discount supermarkets. We'll be hearing about how Tesco is faring a little later in the show. The FCA have fined the Swiss asset manager GAM Holding more than £9 million for three transactions, two of which were related to collapse lender Greensill Capital. Uh, conflict of interest policies were not followed, says says the FCA. And Trainline has cut commission on tickets from 5% to 4.5% and consequently seen a 20% jump in share price, though they still trade uh, almost 50% lower than this time last year. And finally for me, it's been a turbulent quarter for, for global markets. Um, Neil Wilson has a good roundup in uh, Thursday's Today's Markets article on the IC website. But in a nutshell, and at time of recording, the FTSE 100 is up around 3% for, for Q1, a much stronger performance than its peers. Um, the DAX down 7%, for instance, and S&P 500 down 3.5%. Right, time to dive into our topics for today. First up, our company results spotlight of the week goes to, drumroll please, British house builder Bellway. Indeed. Uh, indeed. Luckily for us, Mark Robinson has written these up and is here to tell us tell us about them. What are the headlines, please, Mark? Well, I haven't got any. I mean, uh, not as such. But what, what sort of interested me about Bellway's uh, results as much as anything is that they uh, managed to keep growing uh, margins uh, against an inflationary backdrop. I mean, the, the period was to the end of uh, January, so they'd have caught uh, a certain uh, certain portion of uh, the inflation that's come through since the last quarter of uh, last year. Um, and so, you know, that that in itself is, uh, is quite interesting. The company says that um, it believes UK house price growth will, uh, will continue to outstrip cost increases although i have um i have some doubts uh, in that regard um of course the the reason for uh, you know we've seen inflation that's inflation costs they've been um 
increasing exponentially in recent months, certainly in terms of the construction industry. Um, a lot of this is to do with the commodity commodity prices, and um, there there's a strong correlation to U.S. dollar value. So al although the U.S. money supply, you know, while the U.S. money supply remains at record levels, in inflation will con continue to bubble up. I believe um, the only you know the only caveat there is if we see it, it, it may slow and slow appreciably, but it would take a a sizable fall in aggr aggregate demand in the global economy to put the brakes on. Uh, and that, that's obviously why further rate rises uh, are expected. Um, I went in to point out in the article that rates as they are, are still very low from an historical perspective. So even if uh, we get a couple of further quarter point rises in historical terms, we, we're still we're still well below the uh, the 30 year average, which I think is 7.2% or I can't remember the figure, but it's something along those lines well, for the base rate. Um, you know, the, will will house price inflation keep on keep on going? I was talking to a friend of this uh, of mine the other night about this, who's got uh, a number of investment properties. And uh, he, he was pointing out that there are many people out there, many homeowners out there, many investors for that matter, I've never really been privy to um, uh, falling house prices or property prices. And I, he was talking about the situation that uh, developed in the early 1990s when there were so many homeowners and investors that found themselves in a, a negative equity um, uh, position. Uh, it, it's, hard to, it's, it's hard to imagine that happening uh, in the near, near term. Uh, but the thing about it, I. I don't think that's necessarily uh, due to the structural drivers of, you know, we, we, we've seen, there's, there's been a shortfall in uh, housing starts for, for years now. And that's one of the structural drivers of the industry, just demographics point to the fact that uh, demand will continue to outstrip supply. But as I say, I, I don't think that's necessarily the reason why we're seeing uh, growth in this area. I think it's more, as much to do with the, uh, uh, currency debasement uh, as anything else. I mean, we've we've had we had a decade of, uh, or more than a decade of uh, quantitative easing, uh, and now we've got that. Finally, that inflation has been unbottled and is coming through as the money supply has expanded uh, as rapidly as it has done. So, so really, uh, it's house prices aren't. They're not really um, reacting to the normal market dynamics. Well, that, that's my view anyway there uh, well the, nonetheless you know bellway's order book has in, increased by up by about a quarter during the, the half year period and uh, it's also significantly um, increased uh, the value of its land bank um, you know probably a question again is this growth sustainable given the outlook for interest rates well we'll find out in the uh, in, in due course. One of the other things I noticed about within the results as well is there was obviously a reference to the, um, the set aside for the, the Grenfell Tower disaster. I think uh, Bellway had to put another 22 million pounds uh, to that effect, bringing the total up to about 178 million, I think it was. 187, um, I think. You've, 187, you've okay, yeah. okay. Um, but you know, that, that that's been well covered in the press, but there's another there's another issue which actually might feed into construction costs again, and that's uh, linked to uh, professional indemnity insurance, uh, because what's happened uh, in in the wake of the Grenfell disaster is that more and more contractors and their suppliers have become litigious, trying to work out you know where, what's the old adage uh, where there's blame that there's a claim, and and so this is increased. And it's a, in, insurance insurers now are seeing increased activity uh, in the wake of the disaster and the, and the subsequent inquiry. Um, so we're seeing a, a substantial increase in the number of notifications uh, being issued to insurers by uh, contractors and and designers uh, up and down the country in relation to um, aluminium 
composite material, the, uh, the you know, the crux of the problem there at Grenfell. Um, and, and so while you're seeing this rise in notification and actual claims, it's, it's causing insurance, insurers to look at the premiums being charged as well as the, uh, the type of cover being offered. Some insurance, insurers are actually withdrawing from that uh, professional indemnity insurance market or, or changing the basis of uh, policies. See, the, the bottom line is that it's likely to feed into c construction costs. Uh, already we've seen problems in, in certain boroughs linked to uh, social housing and the cost there with uh, some, pro um, some projects being uh, cancelled outright. So, you know, if you're, if you're in that position, you're, you're going to um, have to, if you're a, a contractor, you're going to have to ask yourself, you know, will a, uh, an indemnity policy renewal uh, even be offered by your insure, insurer? And, uh, what, you know, you're going to wonder about the, the premiums themselves that may eat in, into your bottom line. You know, can you even afford the premiums? And um, should you just let the policy lapse uh, and start again in order to um, amend the scope of a historical cover. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a real conundrum for uh, the industry now. And it's another reason I think why, why costs will continue to, to bubble up. Just what, you know, uh, it's worth remembering as well that the UK isn't quite so bad as other locales in the world in, in terms of affordability uh, for housing. That relationship I talked about last week between median incomes and average house prices, the UK is uh, in a better position than uh, some other countries. But there's there's obviously a limit, you know, when you've got real wages shrinking, um, that multiple becomes uh, it, it intensifies effectively. So um, there you go. I've put the kibosh on the construction industry. Uh, Mark, the the thing I thought was was really interesting about your i mean just the the you writing up the results was there i mean they're they're now trading at a discount to their net assets which i mean okay they they face lots they face lots of issues not least of which is a, a slightly unknowable um provisions they're going to have to make to you know for for fire safety remediation and and as you said any insurance uh, fallout that might come but i mean there's they they sit on a land bank. They've got they're in a net cash position. They still have mid teens returns on equity, and yet investors basically think that their their assets are going to lead to a negative return uh, going forward. So I just I, I mean it's just it's just amazing really to see the state of the the house builders at the moment in investors' eyes. They just think there's they really seem like they're they're pricing them in to be primed for a, a crash. I, I mean, you, you, you put them on a buy. I don't know if you, it seems like you agree with that. That it's a bit uh, overdone. Well, I, um, I, I, I quoted actually, um, the, the erudite voice of the last person to cover bell, eh? which is <laughs> your, your good self. Uh, and, uh, then you said that, uh, low, the lowly rating leaves room for missteps, some ex unexpected headwinds and solid returns. Um, it, it's just a question of being able to uh, balance uh, volume growth with higher dividends for shareholders. So, I mean, I don't know, it's 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 a forward yield of about five and a half percent. But, you know, if experience is anything to go by, then the market's probably right and I'm not. Thanks so much, Mark. So that's our, that's our that goes down as our result of the week then. Uh, Bellway, and you can you can find the write up um, in the IC magazine and on the website done by yourself, Mark Robinson. Um, and let's move on to another company who've who've just released an annual report, uh, and that's Burford Capital. Um, the litigation funder have posted its its first pre tax loss of almost sixty million dollars, um, something that's been brushed off by Burford's chairman. Uh, chairman, you've you've covered Burford for us, um, and I wonder if you could break down, well, firstly maybe what they do, and then you know, also some details of this report. Yeah, so um, sort of in very simple terms, litigation funder finances legal claims um, and takes a share of the winnings if the case succeeds. Um, so in many cases, funders might pick cases that would otherwise be too expensive to get off the ground, um, for example, because the, the legal fees were just too expensive. 
Uh, one example would have to be sort of the recent case against the post office, which was brought by um, a private funder, actually, but gives sort of a little insight in how they operate. Um, so the post office case puts funders in a really excellent light in a variety of ways. But I think it's a tricky industry, uh, which is evident in Burford's latest results, really. So as you said, Burford posted its first ever loss of almost $60 million. And they sort of attributed that to, to timing issues. So because litigation takes ages in the UK and the US, and COVID has caused even more holdups in the court system, they basically said they hadn't had um, the cash flowing in like they would have done in a normal year when cases reached a conclusion and they got paid. Um, and as you said, they they were very optimistic and tried to to brush that off, really. But it is an important problem in the sector because um, there are only a few, handful, really, of, of listed litigation funders, but cash flow is extremely unpredictable and the outcome of litigation is also very unpredictable and hard to judge um, from an outsider perspective, I suppose. You know, if you're not a lawyer, you you can't make any meaningful judgment on whether a case will succeed or fail. But another thing to mention, I think, with Burford is um, questions that have been raised over its accounting methods. So obviously there was the Muddy Waters attack in 2019, which it vigorously defended itself from and um, denied all of the allegations about um, its accounting methods. But it's something that analysts raise a lot with the sector, basically because it's difficult to gauge how well companies are doing and the cash flow can be so sort of lumpy, it's hard to know actually what returns will really look like. So I think the results this week really sort of throw that into the spotlight. I think, Gemma, you said it in, in, the, in the piece as well, you kind of highlighted, I suppose, what the attraction of the share case is, that they're, you know, it's, it, it's these sort of alternative assets which is uncorrelated almost to the you know the vagaries of the the stock market and equity risk premium and, and things like that because you're 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 basically backing their legal expertise aren't you and their ability to pick cases which are going to return make a good return on investment but i i mean just just look at your you're looking at your write up which i thought was you know a really brilliant um summary of the the numbers and the i suppose the reason you know the reason for if not concern, then I suppose some of the some of the the, the reasons that there might be a bit of, of scepticism lingering about the model is that all those factors which are assets for the business, i.e., its its ability to just to to you know its ability to fund this new market, are also potentially downsides in that you have very little visibility, limited visibility over, as you said, what what um you know when the returns are going to come how much cash is going to be generated and you know the the their investment i think in peterson which is the big argentina um arbitration claim is you know, still over a billion dollars of of assets on the balance sheet so you know there's there's huge concentration risk still in in their ability to turn assets into cash so um yeah it's a tricky one to call because in in many ways it's quite an exciting industry because yeah. um certainly the english court system seems to be far less suspicious of third party funding than it was, say, a decade ago. And there are these sort of huge class action claims coming through the system, which are funded by these um, by these types of company. Um, and I was also looking into the role of, of big data and litigation funding and companies are starting to um, bring together huge amounts of court data to try and predict the outcome of cases, which I imagine might become a theme that we see as, as the years go on. But it's just, it, it seems sort of quite a capricious in industry as well, which makes it a bit hard for um, to get a real grasp of what's happening. Mm. You, you mentioned the Muddy Waters attack two years ago, and I think a lot of our readers and listeners will uh, remember that, but maybe you could just briefly uh, explain what that, what that was precisely. Yep, so it was in the summer of 2019, I think, um, and basically... Muddy Waters, which is a short seller, raised doubts about Burford's accounting model. And at the heart of that was this question of a disparity between um, sort of the profits that Burford was reporting and its cash generation and basically how it was booking its its unrealised gains. So were, were these profits actually um, real, basically? Mm. Um, and Burford reacted very, very strongly and defended itself um, vigorously from that. But it has 
raised important questions about just the industry as a whole, I think. Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting. Um, alternative asset, just sort of betting on the outcome of uh, of cases, I guess. But they do have a good strike rate, don't they? I think Burford. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they from the the cases that they've picked and have concluded, um, they've got a knack of picking the good ones. So I think it's a a ninety three percent return on invested capital figure that they quote in um, in their latest set of results, um, and they're quite keen to stress that they combine sort of specialist human legal knowledge with this big AI database. Um, so they do seem good at picking them. It's just how the litigation actually progresses, really. Yeah, so I thought it was interesting as well that they, I mean, you point out recently they they, they made a, another sort of big slug of investments in cases, but they're chasing a slightly lower internal rate of return. So the, historically it's been about 30%, but now they're going after sort of the 12 to 20%. Um yeah, I, I thought it was interesting that it's either a sign of, uh, you know, maybe more money chasing chasing cases or just they're, they're looking to balance their, their risks a little bit more and go after things which are a bit more predictable. It's, um, it's kind of still hard to say, isn't it, mm. you know, without seeing the full details of... I think as well because it's becoming more competitive to get suitable cases because... Right. Um, these funders have typically gone after huge value cases because they offer the biggest returns. But because more people are fighting over those now, some are changing tack a little bit and um, opting for smaller cases where you have to invest less. But obviously, you get get less money back. But I was um, I was talking to someone recently who suggested that the sector might start to operate more like a stock market, where lawsuits are basically grouped together into portfolios that people can invest in, rather than just having, for example, a huge class action where it's win or lose and you might lose it all so that might be an interesting thing to watch yeah i think what was uh, so there's a securitization aspect isn't there but then also i think one of the analysts was suggesting that they or they're, they're encouraging burford to become more of an asset manager so they have this like they do this work for so sovereign wealth funds don't they on this kind of manage claims on their behalf but um i think it's peel hunt saying that they they should do this at a greater scale because in some ways it reduces the capital drag on their own their own balance sheet, doesn't it? But, yeah. you know, I mean, interesting if they if they go that way or they're happy to stick with deploying a lot of their own money. Yeah, and it seems that they're wanting to make third-party funding normal in, for example, like a corporate legal department, yeah. whereas it hasn't ever been in the past, particularly in the UK. I think the US has a slightly different legal culture. Yeah. Well, thanks, Gemma. It's, uh, it's a very interesting sector, very interesting company. Uh, I'm sure you'll be all over their, their movements, uh, whatever's to come. Okay, finally for today, uh, and as promised earlier, I wanted to talk about our, our high street grocers. Uh, highest price inflation for, for a decade. Um, although, you wrote, as you wrote earlier in the week, Mark, um, Tesco looks like a viable safe haven. Um, why is that? Well, I just I just thought it would be um, at, at the moment the way things stand within the economy, it's hard to capture uh, a lot of growth out there, and I suspect that many investors will be looking uh, at ways to uh, uh, preserve their capital through any uh, through any downturn in the offing. And there's just a couple of questions that I asked about Tesco. Um, the first one I think was like, will logistics play a, a larger role than price discounting during the the current inflationary period and as you say is the, the company still a solid defensive option and from talking to other uh, writers at the IC the, the answers seem the respective answers seem to be no and yes uh, it's with Tesco at the moment its price is up by uh, a fifth over the last 12 months or so but it's only uh, at the level that it was just prior to uh, the first lockdown. Uh, during that time, in common with uh, its peers in the market, the uh, the grocer expanded its online offering and its delivery service. And there was also costs linked to uh, ensuring that uh, its staff and its customers uh, were safe during the period. I mean, this is a, a well-known narrative now. Uh, during that period, it uh, it secured a, a larger customer base, and earlier this year, Cantor uh, produced some stats 
uh, suggesting that sales are up by about 10, 10% on a two year basis. But more importantly, um, Tesco also picked up market share uh, um, up by 60 basis points to just under 29, uh, 28%, which is a, which is, which is a si significant move from that uh, perspective. Um, you know, but the, the, the trends that, that informed the strategies during the pandemic, uh, they, they've, um, they've, they've, they've given way to uh, considerations how Tesco and other supermarkets will contend during this, you know, high inflation or rapidly rising inflationary period. And I posited anyway that Tesco might be better placed than most due to the um, expanded logistics function, you know, it's it's a, a market leader in that regard in terms of uh, uh, capacity and and arguably expertise too. Um, and that, I think that's the main reason why why it's still a, a viable uh, def defensive option uh, under the current circumstances. Um, you know, one of the primary considerations obviously is, is the ability of uh, retailers or grocers to, to pass on increases through to shoppers themselves and it's 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 debatable whether whether the the big german discounters are any better place than uh the likes of tesco to do this uh, tesco has a, a, a what would what sounds to most people a really narrow net margin uh 1.3%, but that uh, stacks up well against uh, many of its competitors. So, you know, we, we can say it's got a little bit of flexibility in that regard. Um, and th th there's there's still um, share price upside in the offing as well. So, as I say, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not entirely sure that uh, its logistics function or its superior log logistics. Uh, function will place it in a, a superior position to peers at the moment, but um, it's it's certainly worth considering. And that's all I had to say about that. <laughs> Great. Well, Mark, you're uh, you're taking. Do people know you're taking stock, or is that like a, a like a, a secret? Uh... Yeah. Um, the secret's out. There's his face is right next it's, to the. It's, it's yeah. not like Marvel comics. I mean. <laughs> The name. I, actually, I don't think my name is. I'm, I'd, I'd rather keep it un, under the radar as well. You know. <laughs> I, I, it's, 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 Mark, your, your, your face is on every taking stock. I'm afraid, in the in, oh the, in, the, in the print mag. So, um, ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bruce Wayne, you ain't. I've been ma unmasked. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, well, as I say, yeah. it's, uh, well, our, our online-only readers know now as well. So yeah, the secret is the secret is fully out. But yeah, that was your taking stock column um, this week. Tesco, Tesco yeah, safety and numbers. Uh, next week, I'll be writing about Intel. That's something to look forward to. Sexy, a sexy topic. Um, yes. Thanks very much, Mark, and thanks, Gemma, and thanks, Alex, and uh, thank you, listener, um, for sticking with us. And we'll catch up again with you. Uh, same time next week. So we'll see you then. Thank you. Companies and Market Show was edited and produced by me, John Rogers. And don't forget to head on over to iTunes, search Investors Chronicle and hit subscribe for us straight into your feed. Thanks very much and we'll see you next week.